State Representative Dwayne Burns, thank you so much. We appreciate it. So I guess really the first question, the obvious question to start with is why should Republicans reelect you and vote for you instead of your opponent? Well, I think the answer is pretty clear. I have a, a proven record of advocate, advocating for what the folks in this community want and need out of their state government. Um, I'm, a, I'm the conservative choice in the race. I have uh, protected their private property rights. I have been a pro-life candidate. Uh, I have protected our Second Amendment rights, and, uh, and I'm, I'm very in tune with what I think the priorities are for this community. We're a growing community, um, we are a family-oriented community, and, um, and, and I, I think the decisions that I make in the legislature reflect that. And uh, this, is, this is a ministry for myself and my family and my wife, and, uh, um, and, and I'd like to continue that, that mission, that ministry, representing the people uh, of this community. And uh, I, I, I believe I've done a good job. I have a record that I'm proud of and can stand on. And, uh, and that's only possible because the folks in this community have supported me, prayed for me, given me input as I make decisions that affect this community. And that, that's what I want to continue to do. So what would you say your proudest accomplishments are, if you had to name a couple? Well, you know, the, the, big, the big picture um, items that, that get all of the news are, you know, our, our efforts to secure the border, to keep our our budget, a conservative budget, uh, the pro-life victories uh, that, I've, that I've worked on have been uh, some of my most proudest moments. But, you know, I carry a lot of bills for our local folks here, and I'm just as proud of those. Um, we've had bills that affect small businesses in this community that we've, uh, we've, we've uh, filed and passed uh, that help people right here in the community. And so I'm proud of those too. I would, I've kind of become known as the private property rights guy and um, so I've, I've carried eminent domain reform. That, that took us three sessions to get across the finish line, but it was something important to the folks in Johnson and at the time, Bosque County, when I represented Bosque County. And uh, we were up against uh, all odds, up against the, you know, the big guys, all the folks that have eminent domain authority. So, you know, the railroads, the, um, the, the cities, the pipeline folks, all of that kind of stuff, electric companies. And, uh, but I just felt like that we've got to preserve our property rights. And if someone's coming to take your property for a beneficial use for the public good, um, it should be hard. You should have the same uh, opportunity that they have and you should, you, should, uh, you should be able to fight for your property and, uh, and it, should be, uh, it should be something that's hard to do to take your property to, to be used forever. And uh, so I've, I've fought for that. We finally got that passed. And then this last session, we passed the right to farm bill and uh, it actually became a constitutional amendment that passed in November, and uh, another effort to protect private property rights. Uh, I believe that safe, affordable food supply is important to the people in this area, and, and Texas, and, and, and the rest of the country, and uh, we, we saw some uh, examples where cities were passing ordinances in the name of public safety um, that were really just aimed at pushing these farmers out of business. They were farmers that were used to be in rural areas, but as cities had grown, they were now found themselves in kind of suburban areas and in city limits at times. And these ordinances were aimed at, at pushing them off their property. And uh, I went there, met with them, we talked about it and drafted some bills. They came and told their stories and uh, we were able to form, uh, pass the bills and then make it a constitutional amendment that the rest of Texas approved and uh, protects their property rights and protects the, uh, the affordability and, and abundance of our food supply going forward. So those are some of my most proudest moments, but again, um, it's about the local folks. It's about what, you know, whatever I can do to help them, whether it be with an agency, we've helped folks with everything you can think of, with uh, you know, uh, adoptions, we've helped folks with insurance issues. You, know, you never know what's gonna come down the pipe. Just, it doesn't have to be a piece of legislation, but I'm, I'm certainly proud of the conservative legislation that, that I've had my name on and, and been a part of. As you know, uh, your opponent has the endorsement of a lot of Republican leaders from former President Trump to Governor Abbott, Senator Cruz, Lieutenant Governor Patrick, uh, A.G. Paxton, et cetera. How do you go up against you know, those big names who have backed your opponent? What do you say to people out in the district? Well, um, so uh, I, those endorsements are impressive. Um, I, I think her, her Rolodex may be, uh, you know, bigger than mine. Um, but really, 
uh, those endorsements don't mean as much to me as the endorsements of the folks here in the community. And I have the endorsements of um, most of the mayors, uh, the county commissioners, um, you know, local school boards, and you know, most of the local elected officials, but really it's the endorsement of the individuals and the folks in this community that matter the most to me. Uh, none of the folks that you just listed can vote here in Johnson or Somerville County. And if, if one of them wants to move here and vote, I'll care more about what they think about uh, this race. But uh, many of those endorsements and those, or all of those endorsements were made for one reason. And it's because I voted against uh, the governor's voucher plan. And um, that's, that's no secret. And uh, that's, that's what that's about. And uh, it's about money and power and me voting against that voucher plan that I thought was bad for our community. Why? I thought it was bad for a couple of reasons. Um, number one, it was expensive. It was gonna cost a billion dollars in the first biennium, then jump to two billion the next year, 2.3 the next year, at a time when people are screaming from the rooftops that our property taxes are too high. Please do something about it. And the legislature responded and said, we're going to uh, offer the largest property tax cut in history. I felt like it was a bait and switch for us to then turn right around and say, okay, we're gonna cut your property taxes, but create a brand new program, a brand new government program that's gonna cost billions of dollars. And at the same time, the uh, illegal immigrants would be eligible for the voucher. And but just, that never came up during, that was only something that came up in response to the governor. That never came up during the, the regular session. Well, I, I, I or the spe any special session, it, right? Well, it was it was it was brought up. It wasn't uh, debated on the microphones, but I, I figured that out early on. I served as a school board member before I did this, and um, I knew you know I asked questions as a school board member about funding, and you know we've got a lot of kids in our district that are, appear to be some of them may be uh, illegal immigrants. Do we know? And they, and the, the answer to that is no, we don't know who's illegal and who's not because the Supreme court says we educate all kids and our constitution says we're going to offer free and public ed free public education. So I learned that, you know, early on that we didn't know who, uh, who, who were educating illegally or illegally. And then when the governor wanted a universal plan, um, which, you know, uh, he was adamant about a universal plan. If you're eligible for public school, then you'd be eligible for the voucher. That meant that um, illegal immigrants would be eligible for the voucher. And then as a, as a test for who would get the voucher first, uh, it was going to be means tested. And often our poorest kids are those that are here illegally. Um, so while it wasn't uh, put out there publicly a lot, it wasn't talked about in the media a lot. Um, I knew that and was talking to uh, other members about that and had concerns about that um, and and one of the reasons why I oppose it. Is there any scenario in which you would change your mind? Well I think that uh, I've got to be flexible. I've got to be willing to listen to what the constituents that I serve want um, and that's what I'll do. I don't think that they've changed their mind on those two things, on, on uh, you know, offering this, uh, a voucher to illegal immigrants. I, I still think that folks in this community would be opposed to that. But if we could change that, I think there's, uh, you know, room to look. I think if you're uh, uh, going to lower the cost of the program, there, there may be opportunities. But, you know, I think we got to start with what's best for kids. That's been my approach since I served on a school board and my approach as I've served in the legislature. What's best for kids? And uh, I think, uh, I think there's, there's room for private schools, there's room for home school, there is room for public schools and charter schools, and it ought to be easy for parents to be able to move within those, uh, move within schools in a district, move from district to district. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm for school choice in that aspect. I think we ought to protect the parents' rights to choose those things, and it ought to be easy for them to do that. I just think we've got to be very careful when we're talking about sending public money to private companies or private, uh, private education because not only does it uh, you know, cost a lot, take money potentially from public funds, but it also, um, anytime there's government, government money involved, there's going to be strings attached. And while we have private schools that, that define their, their, their job and what they do and what they provide very, very, uh, very tightly, um, when you start adding government funds into that, 
then there's the potential for the government to say, well, we don't agree with that, or we don't like that part, or we don't want that part. And then you start to change what's good and what's the best about what those private institutions are offering. And the same goes for homeschoolers. So we've got to be very careful about that and, and make sure we're not doing more harm than good. You talked about your constituents. What are they telling you about this on this issue? Uh, they tell me pretty much exactly what I just told you. They're for school choice. They want the ability to to raise their children and put their children in the schools that they choose. But um, they don't want to create a new government bureaucracy. They don't want this to be an increased burden on their, uh, you know, their, their shoulders because of an increase in property taxes or any other tax. And, uh, um, you know, and they want to preserve the, the, the good that what they've got going on in homeschool pods and in private schools. I, you know, I visit with those, those folks and support them personally. Um, and my kids went to public school, but I think what they're, the jobs they're doing is important. And, um, and I, and I visited with them about it and they are very concerned about, um, the government, maybe not at this point, but down the road as the ball gets rolling, um, telling them, well, you can't do that with state funds. You know, this is a state funded thing. You can't, you can't, you can't do that. You can't pick and choose. You can't do these things. And, um, and that, so that's what I'm hearing from my folks, all of those things, that the things that give them concern, things that I'm concerned about too. If you're reelected, what are your priorities, your top priorities? Number one, we've got to do something about the border. I mean, it is a crisis. It's the crisis of the day. And, uh, um, that is what I hear from everyone in this, in this district is secure the border. Number two, property taxes. We're taxing folks out of their homes. I mean, I, I hear about it, I see it. Uh, people cannot afford the property taxes, even when they've paid off a home. We've got to do something about that. And that means, and whether that's reform, lowering them more, eliminating them, um, we've got to do something about that. And then thirdly, I think, I think education is an important part of our community. It's a, it's a constitutional requirement. And uh, anytime you move into a community, the first thing folks ask is, how good are the schools? And when they move into Texas, people are saying, how good are the schools? And when we visit anyone around here, they say, how good are the schools? And, and so we've got, to, we've got to support our schools. We've got to support public education, all facets, uh, our teachers mainly. Um, so that, that's the third thing. And I think that's where you know, the, the voucher question gets brought up again. Um, and that you know, I think there's, again, room for everybody. But, uh, we've got to be careful about the a voucher because there are parts of it that, that just we can't live with. And, and even, even my opponent has stated that she would not, at, at a recent forum, that she would not be for uh, certain tenets of the, pro, of the voucher program that was included in the governor's voucher plan. And uh, which I think is ironic because um, had she voted against it for the same reasons I did, um, or if it came up next session, if she were to win and it, the bill comes up again, and it has those same tenants in it, and now she said she opposes some of those tenants, and she votes against the bill, well then I guess she might find herself in a position where the governor were endorsing against her in two years. Um, and uh, so it's a, it's a crazy, it's a, it's a crazy thing, but uh, um, hopefully people can see through all of this and, and understand what this, what this race is about. So, so let's break down some of the things that uh, you <laughs> talked about as far as border. Um, Governor Abbott reportedly criticized you uh, in a report that I saw and where he said, to be clear, I don't trust you on the border or any issue. How do you respond to that? Man, that hurts, honestly. I've had a great relationship with the governor for the last uh, several years. Um, I, I, I feel like I'm one of the guys he could go to to, to take counsel, to uh, you know, talk about the process, about getting legislation through the through the House. Uh, I've carried bills for the governor's office. Uh, a few years ago when uh, the defund the police movement was moving across, well, the governor had a priority effort to stop that. He came to me and I carried a, a pillar of that plan. Uh, there was an omnibus bill that carried, that had all of the tenants to the plan, but then we, he farmed those out to other members too in case something happened to the big bill. Luckily the big bill passed, but I carried a tenant of that bill. And uh, so I've been a guy that I feel like he could go to and trust. Uh, I was even with him the week that we took the vote on this voucher plan, trying to help them thread the needle and find a way for something to pass. I just couldn't, I couldn't vote for it personally because of the way it was set, but I, I, I was trying to figure out if, 
maybe a pilot project would work better. If we pared down the population on who would be uh, eligible, uh, you know, how do we look at, you know, who could be eligible and what the qualifications for were for, you know, uh, the order in which we you would administer the vouchers, but governor wasn't interested unfortunately i think he was interested but it just didn't uh, we he, he, he didn't wanted to be it. universal mm -hmm. ultimately needed to be universal didn't support those changes and um and then and here we are uh but i support the governor's efforts at the border i always have i have been uh one of his strongest allies when it comes to that and so for him to say those things is uh in my opinion, very disingenuous, and, and, and it kind of hurts me. I thought we were closer than that. Um, we've, uh, I've voted for all of the funding mechanisms for Operation Lone Star and the border. I have voted for the Border Prosecution Unit for the Transnational Intelligence Unit, additional employees and uh, DPS troopers at the border, um, and I think we need to go further, and I'm prepared to support and work with him on that once I'm reelected. Do you have any ideas about how to go further? Yeah, I think if you were to create a uh, Texas own uh, border protection unit where we have law enforcement dedicated to that. Right now we are, uh, we're adding DPS troopers, uh, but that, and that's a good thing, but we're also still pulling DPS troopers from the interior of the state to go visit the border. And that hurts our interior counties because when Johnson County is without, without a DPS trooper or two or whatever for an extended amount of time, then we suffer here and it makes it harder on uh, for folks to fight crime right here in Johnson County. You supported HB 20 last session? Yep. And that didn't pass. What, let me ask you about SB 4, because that's in the courts right now. Yeah. So if it ultimately is ruled unconstitutional, then what? So I think, I think uh, you know, the governor has already to his credit even said you know invoked the articles of the constitution that say our state has the ability and should have the ability to enforce its own immigration laws if the federal government's not going to do it and the federal government's shown that they're not going to do it and uh so i, I and senate bill four is part, important kind of aspect and part of that because it creates as uh, folks know the ability for law enforcement across the state to arrest someone who crosses illegally, creates an, a state crime for crossing the border illegally. And um, with severe repercussions, if you return to the state afterwards, creates a felony. And uh, if that's ultimately knocked down, um, I think that is a, 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 that puts Texas in a, stuff, a tough spot in, in, in using our own law enforcement to enforce immigration law. And so uh, I think, but, but we can't give up. We've got we've to keep doing what we're doing until the federal government steps in. That's uh, one of the, the keys is we need to hope and pray for a president and a Congress that sees what we see here in Texas, and that is that this is the crisis issue. The border is the issue. We've got to secure the border. Federal government has the resources to do that. They have the money to do that and the manpower to do that, and they could do that, and, and I hope and pray that they will do that under new leadership. You talked about property tax relief. Do you support the idea of eliminating property taxes? I, I do. I do. In fact, I have uh, I've co-sponsored and, and signed on to bills and voted for bills that would do just that. I, uh, I even carried a constitutional amendment that unfortunately didn't pass that said if we uh, eliminate the M&O, maintenance operations part of your school taxes, that you couldn't create a new tax similar and call it something else and do an old bait and switch there um, so but uh, but yes i am I, I think there there are ways to do that with value-added tax uh, you'd have i think in fact i wouldn't take anything off the table uh, as far as how to do that but um, it is the it's it's the number two issue off sometimes number one behind even in front of the border with folks here locally and uh, so we've i've got to respond i've got a duty res to respond to that and uh, um, I think one of the things that should be on the table is absolutely eliminating it. Gradually? So that the state has a chance to figure out how to fund the government and schools, as you said? Yeah, absolutely. We don't want to do anything irresponsible. Um, we want to do what's in the best interest of our taxpayers and our citizens. And creating chaos doesn't do that. So if it, if it needs to be a gradual situation, I'm for that. If we can somehow figure out a way to do it in a, in a rapid in a rapid way, I'm, I'm for that as well. 
Um, if it takes an extended period, let's do that. But let's let's look at it. Let's let's take a serious look at it and see how we can do it and make it happen. You talked about teachers. Should they be getting a raise? Yes, absolutely. In fact, I voted for a raise for them uh, during the during the session, in House Bill 100. Uh, unfortunately, the you know when the voucher the, the plan the the funding was tied to the voucher plan, as you know. And uh, when the bill came back from the Senate, there was a voucher plan attached to all of the uh, additional funding that would have gone straight to teachers and some other things that were good for public education in that bill. And uh, there was an amendment to take the voucher plan out, and I voted for that amendment. Um, because again, the reasons I stated are bad for Texas, bad for my, my community. And uh, was wholeheartedly ready to vote for the bill, but unfortunately the bill author pulled the bill down after the voucher plan was pulled out of the bill, so I never had the opportunity to once again vote for those, those raises, and I would have. Where are you on Democratic committee chairs? <laughs> because there's a lot of criticism by conservatives that Speaker Phelan has allowed this uh, still, even though it was reduced, the number was reduced last session. So where are you on this? Yeah, well, you know, our, our chairmanships are picked by the Speaker. Yeah, I don't, I don't pick those, the Speaker picks those. And, um, and, and, and that's where it lies. And I, I understand why he did that. Uh, most people don't know it takes 100 votes to pass a constitutional amendment. It takes 100 votes to pass an amendment on third reading to any bill. So um, we only have 85 Republicans. If you're, if you're going to pass a constitutional amendment like the right to farm bill uh, plan that we just passed or a property tax cut like we passed uh, in November, you need a hundred votes, and if you take one party and completely alienate them and don't give them a seat at the table, every vote becomes partisan. And so um, you're going to be faced with, you know, 85, 65, 85, 60, and it's 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 not a not necessarily conducive to d conducting the state's business. Some of our priorities would have died because of that. So I think, uh, you know, Speaker Phelan looked he looked at folks that he could trust. Uh, that we could all work with and, um, and place them in committee chairs, whether they're Republicans or Democrats. And again, like you said, fewer Democrats than we had last session, and there were Democratic chairs in the Senate as well. And um, so I, I don't want to cede any power to the other party, for sure. I don't want to have a Democrat speaker, and I don't think we need Democrat chair of uh, appropriations or ways and means or calendars or state affairs or any of those committees that handle the priorities of the state. Um, but, uh, you know, those are the decisions made by the Speaker. And uh, as you know, Speaker Phelan is really up, uh, he's in a similar spot as you as far as being in a runoff. Um, very tough race, a lot of vitriol, um, and he's facing criticism from other state leaders like Lieutenant Governor and A.G. Paxton. So I'm wondering, do you support him? Do you think it would be good if he were reelected and uh, do you think he would be Speaker again? Well, I, I think Speaker Phelan, I've, I came in with Speaker Phelan. Um, we, we entered the, the House at the same time. And he's a, he's a conservative person. We wouldn't have constitutional carry if it weren't for Speaker Phelan. Um, we wouldn't have uh, some of the pro-life measures that we've, and, and, and gains that we've made in the House if it weren't for Speaker Phelan. Uh, Speaker Phelan is specifically carried a bill that allowed constitutional carry in the event of a natural disaster. And that was kind of the testing ground to see if it would work for the rest of the state. And we knew it would. And so he carried that. He's from the Beaumont area, you know, down on the coast. And, um, and passed that for his area. And then we were able to see and prove to everybody else, look, it, it will work. It's great. It's a great plan. We need constitutional carry for the rest of the state. And a lot of people don't know that about Speaker Phelan. He is also one of the guys that has uh, spent more time walking and more money, his own campaign money, um, trying to secure uh, Republican candidates and help Republican candidates in South Texas across all along the border, in local races and house races and uh, through Project Red and, and different things like that. And so I think if we're going to look at any individual, we've got to look at their whole body of work. And, you know, a lot of folks don't know about or they discount the fact that he has done a ton to... Uh, move South Texas in the direction of Republicans. Um, we've got Republican House members that were once Democrat seats. Uh, we've got local 
uh, you know, elected officials now that are Republicans where there had never been Republicans even filing for office in those areas. And a, a, large, a lot of that credit is due to Dave, to Dave Field. Last question, contract with Texas, this idea brought by some of the conservatives. Do you support it? Um, some of the tenants in the contract for Texas are, are great, uh, but I hate to sign any kind of contract that takes away my ability to choose for my district and to allow my constituents to weigh in on an individual basis on a yes or no and how I and, and, and how they want me to vote on a particular thing. Anytime you sign an oath or a contract or a pledge that I'm going to do this no matter what, you've taken your ability to reason out of it, you've taken your ability to make decisions out of it, you've, uh, you've taken the representation part out of it, in my opinion, and that's what people hire me to do, make tough decisions. And some of those decisions are tough, you know, but I've got to Got to weigh the opinions of my constituents. I've got to look at how it lines up with our Constitution and my own biblical values and, uh, and make the best decisions I can based on that. So I really, I shy away from signing any contracts or oaths with any outside groups or anything like that that would take away the voice of my constituents. State Representative Dwayne Burns, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thank you very much.